This episode is brought to you by United Airlines. What's new with United? Well, two new planes a week, that's what. But what does that mean? It means new and redesigned planes with things like larger overhead bins with room for everyone's roller bag, power outlets at every seat, screens at every seat, and the ability to connect your Bluetooth headphones to those screens. Plan your trip today at united.com or on their award-winning app. This amount is an estimated average of current aircraft delivery schedules. Final delivery schedule subject to change. The world looks different from behind the handlebars of a rad power bike. A trip to the grocery store can turn into an impromptu visit to the pool. Commuting becomes a chance to skip traffic and grab an iced coffee. And spring break is always just a bike ride away. There's never been a better time to find your fun. Check out Rad's limited time spring deals today at radpowerbikes.com. Hey, what is going on? It is the Man Fuse Podcast. Kay Lee here, your host, my co-host, Ben H. We will conclude our conversation with Matthew LaCroix today. And in this episode, we're going to talk about Matt's theory about living in a binary solar system and what the probe Pioneer 10 discovered in the 80s. Could that have anything to do with not only wiping out the dinosaurs, but wiping out these ancient civilizations as well? Okay, so this is basically, in a nutshell, quick summary. You know, NASA's trying to figure out the solar system in the 1960s. We have the whole moon experience. We start to try to figure out our solar system. We don't really know a lot. The Babylonian civilizations and Sumerians, if anything, knew more about the solar system than we did. Um, Do. Well, now we do. But anyway. What year did he say? In the 60s. I was going to say, because 1958 was a really interesting year. Yeah, so the 50s, 60s, they're kind of like trying to figure things out. And then in the 19, yeah. 1971 and 72, 73, this is when they actually put it in action. They create the first technology of a probe that can actually leave our inner solar system. And they're called the Pioneer Probes, Pioneer 10 and 11. I'll constantly mention when I talk about this is that most people who know anything about this or anything to do with probes in space have usually only heard of Voyager. Right. Well, because the Voyager came after. Right. But the Pioneer Probes were the first craft to pass in interstellar space in 1983, and yet nobody talks about them. So wow. anyway. Yeah, I didn't even know about that. I know. So this is where this gets into literally like a rabbit hole. Another one. Another one. <laughs> another one. <laughs> another like rabbit DJ hole. Yeah, another, another one. one. <laughs> so remember, remember this whole thing? of catastrophes well turns out you know i've studied antarctic ice cores we can go back in antarctica we can take vostok ice core samples 450,000 years ago and see trends of cycles here Interesting. what you see is that there seems to be a, an ice age glaciation that seems to happen about a, every 100,000 years consistently there's cycles that are going on here that are triggering these consistent things now consistently when those ice ages end they end in catastrophe every time every time and, and when we're those obviously ice ages, on the ass end of an ice age and when interglacial meaning non-ice ages move into ice ages they also have catastrophes mm. so what it means is that look humans are maybe perpetuating a natural cycle but we are doing nothing like what we're being told if you look at climatic history of earth the temperature fluctuations and swings that we're looking at now are like almost not even a blip compared to what happened in the past not even a blip so it's changing climate change i'm so we're seeing evidence from siberia in the 19 one, Edward Toll found evidence of massive graveyards of mastodons and mammoths and other species that seem to have flash frozen while in the middle of eating uh, huh. and basically were frozen into an ice cube. Dang. And it was determined in order to do that, you would have had to have temperatures that drop to 150 degrees below zero instantly. Just immediately. The yeah. coldest temperature on record on Earth in, in our modern human history is negative 128. Dang. Wow. Okay, so I know we're getting sensational here, but the point is the history of Earth and our climate is chaotic, if anything. Don't think of it as being consistent. Right. Now, imagine they send these probes out and they don't really know what they're looking for, but they know that our entire solar system is slightly tilted on its axis from something gravitationally influencing it. Okay. They know that because they look at Uranus and Neptune and they're kind of tilted weird. Okay. Astronomers don't need to see something to know it's there. If something's affecting something else, that's all they need to know. They just see the influence 
equivalence of it, right? Right. It's more theoretical or, or mathematical. Yeah. Well, the point is that space isn't illuminated if you don't have a star. So if you don't have any illumination occurring, everything's going to be dark. You're only going to see the influences of what that object is doing based on its mass and gravity. Interesting. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, so, I get it. That makes sense. Now imagine our solar system is two parts, not like you've been taught. Imagine there's an inner solar system and an outer solar system. Okay. That inner solar system is representative of everything beyond the sun, Uranus, Neptune, all the way out to what's called the Kuiper Belt. And that Pluto, unfortunately, that got demoted, was originally a moon that was thrown out into orbit by something. Got it. By some, by something. Okay. Now, at the edge of the solar system is what's called the Kuiper Belt. It's a massive asteroid field. And beyond that is what's called the outer solar system. Then when you eventually go beyond that, which is huge, you get out into space. Okay. Right. But our star system, our star has a much larger amount of space for our constellation, our star here with its planetary systems than we know it is. And what I mean by that is when NASA sent out the Pioneer probes to, to investigate, when they reached interstellar space in 1983, they found a planet that was like peculiar out there in the middle of nowhere. Beyond the Kuiper Belt, they find this planet that's four to five times the size of Earth they stay. And it's just really weird because it's, of course, rogue planets are very rare, but most planets are revolving around some kind of a star yeah okay so this planet's just kind of doing its thing out there and it's really it's kind of on it's, it's acting strange all the objects in the kyber belt are acting strange and they in initially reported this that another planet existed out there well this is where it gets into a huge conspiracy because two astronomers started investigating this to figure out what its planetary companion is robert named robert harrington who is the head of the u.s navy astronomy department that's like a high level guy Right. And then you have a guy named Thomas Van Flandern, who is a, a U.S. astronomer who is well known. He calls up Robert Harrington's like, look, Pioneer Data found this planet. NASA's kind of looking into it. They're affiliated with NASA, but they're not NASA. They're affiliated. And so they start looking at it themselves. Well, at the same time, the Pioneer probe is traveling further and further out into space. And it finds something mm. that completely changes our perspective. Well, at the time, NASA's perspective forever. And what they found is that they found something so, so bizarre that it, it's what caused hiding of data and controlling the narrative and all the stuff that happened later. They found that this planet was revolving around a incredibly distant binary companion to our star, our sun. Okay. Now, before I lose everybody on the call, <laughs> go on my website and I'll show you proof that will blow your mind. On my website, thestageoftime.com, scroll about halfway down the, the main page. You're going to see an image from what's called the 1987 Science and Invention Encyclopedia. Okay. From what I've done, I've determined studying this we and I'm writing it. a new book on it right now is that this is the only place that any of the data from the Pioneer 10 and 11 survived anywhere. It seems that when this binary star companion was discovered, they must have ran physics, you know, rotational tests to see its uh, aphelion and perihelion around our sun. And they determined that, look, these catastrophes, these ice ages and these cycles that are extreme that have destroyed civilizations throughout history are primarily and not say the only source but primarily based on the influences of this object and what what is the object they found that based on the telemetry and the technology that is on this probe they found that the signature of this object was it's got a massive gravitational pull first of all potentially stronger than our sun potentially but it doesn't have any illumination they determined that it's a dead star means that when a star dies it goes through two processes one that people are familiar with it's a super massive star it'll go through a supernova and it'll often turn into a black hole yeah but that's for a super super massive star we don't have anything like that anywhere near us right that's like century and beetlejuice and those guys right yeah if it's not massive it'll explode into a mini nova smaller but then it'll turn into like this dense dark black object that that is still a star but has no illumination it's just got like a massive radiation core with a lot of gravitational influence still. So you mean like as it moves, it would be moving planets in our solar system. Imagine a gigantic dance going on between our suns, our stars. Mm. Our sun has a dance that doesn't bring it very close or we'd all be dead. But there's a dance where its distances allow a large rotational dance that has influences on everything in the solar system, but also comes into play with three other potential things. One, if the planets also align at the same time. Two, what kind of cycles is our sun already going through? And three, if that all aligns with the pass of this star being a certain proximity. If those all seem to come along, if those all seem to coincide, it seems to 
to cause catastrophes on the earth that what we're talking about is imagine something called like crustal displacement and tectonic shifts like every single tectonic plate on the earth goes off right now you want to give the evidence for this most of the ancient megaliths around the world are aligned precisely to magnetic north and south yeah the ancients loved to do that they were masters of those ancient sites that we know of those structures that are a certain age every single one of them and i mean 100 percent of them are off magnetic north by 23 and a half degrees everywhere on the earth wow meaning that the entire planet shifted the axis Wow. So there's your explanation for how you imagine if you had all those things coming together 13,000 years ago and imagine the sun is bombarding the earth with cosmic rays and the magnetic poles shift and every single plate goes off in every volcano. And then you have tsunamis that are like two, three, how about five miles high driving around the world. Right. And that's why they talk about floods in ancient stories and all of these things. And that's where you tie in all of this stuff in these catastrophes is that the earth goes through these periods where it's like basically the end of the world it's like that movie the day after tomorrow yeah yeah where, exactly where it, like, like it that. freezes and it's just everyone's yeah. just is just ice like if you yeah i mean like yeah exactly remember, remember the mammoths remember the mammoths i told you that edward toll found they were frozen with undigested food in their stomachs and neck yeah. and their throats because that's that, it's the because, same thing as the scene with the helicopters in that movie their fuel gauges freeze right everything just freezes like, it's yeah. the same thing. It's the same thing. That's pretty. That's it's pretty intense. wicked. That is wicked, man. Why? Well, so need... sorry. We have to add this layer, though, to understand the implications of this object are so severe that it was buried, like if an asteroid was coming that was going to be impending to hit Earth. And all knowledge of this binary companion was wiped from everything. And Robert Harrington and Thomas Green Flanner, the only two prominent astronomers looking into it, they both mysteriously die within a short time of each other. They both die of throat cancer. Neither of them were smokers. The whole story is Miles Standish gets put in the head of the astronomy department, comes out, says that all mathematical calculations based on this planet that Pioneer found, based on the planet that Robert Harrington and Thomas Flanner were looking into, all mathematical calculations, the whole thing buried. And Everything it, wiped. Then, then, only place that ever existed for Pioneer data, and I have searched and sourced, and that's why I'm writing a book on this, I'm somewhat of an expert, is that for some reason, the 1987 Science and Invention Encyclopedia, page 2,480, was the only place that decided to include a diagram that gives us the entire truth, but says nothing about it in the description. It's nuts. That's crazy, man. And it says in it, for those who can't see it, in 1983, Pioneer 10 detected that this star was 50 billion miles from it. Is this the black sun? Yes. It's been called the dark star, the black sun. Is that why David Bowie called his album that? Who knows? But this is something that is woven into some parts of culture. and Big time. Especially and so, when you understand like, like the opposite of energy or whatever, right? It, like it's dark been called matter. the destroy it. Yeah, the destroyer or nemesis in some places right yeah uh -huh. the destroyer of worlds so the science wonder... invention encyclopedia is the only place that publishes it and if you look at the image this is what i need people to wrap their heads around they're gonna say well how do you know how significant this star is to all these cycles how do you know in that depiction it says that pioneer 10 leaves the kuiper belt and yet it finds pioneer 10 and 11 which by the way 11 goes a totally different direction they both find equal pull gravitationally on every single object including our sun in our solar system from that object it means that that object is equally affecting every single thing in our solar system meaning it's dictating everything so wherever so, for where it goes it's moving shit so there's here. another it's like um two opposing forces like magnetic it's, it's yeah magnetic like exactly aspect. they're it's spinning around each spin. other the positive and the negative imagine right we know that of all solar yang. systems yes isn't that funny the microcosm macrocosm it's almost like our solar system was designed like in this artificially weird way to represent that it's it's weird yeah but that's what the text state is like is that they move things around and like made it like that it's weird that's all i can tell you is that it's bizarre that's so but i know Oh, and, and the thing is that it seems to play a significant role only as far back as like half a million years and it's like it wasn't there anymore. So this is a really weird speculation and I want to take another level. The depth is it. When did this thing explode? When did this cycle emerge? When did this happen like this? And that's what I'm writing the new book on. I was trying to figure out. I was like, well, have we been lied about the dinosaurs too? Is Did this thing explode 65 million years ago and kill them? Right. And then alter the whole planet for being really warm to then having cycles and then bring on mammals? Like the implications of this is vast yeah it is wow and being that 
you know, we're, we're at a place where we're having less and less ice in antarctica less and less oh uh, we're at the definitely at the end of this cycle for sure you know when when the bottom of the apple starts looking sparse and then at the same time you know you see continents in the north on some ancient maps and and, that's be, and there's that's maps because they moved around well yeah and, and then there's maps with cities on antarctica and you know old old maps that's the thing is that there are land masses depicted in some old maps that is described like plato and diodorus that talk about atlantis being destroyed and how it, it has a very very detailed story coming out of egypt and how elder priest named sanchez who's the head of this temple of sace talked about all these ancient catastrophes and land masses and civilizations that were destroyed and how there was a land mass that atlantis existed on that was subducted and destroyed under the ocean and no longer exists that's what we have to start thinking about with Earth history. Not what's called gradualism, but some extreme moments of things happening quite quickly. Right, yeah. It's not like it was like slowly, year after year, like water levels no. rose. Like it, like boom, like boom. in a day yeah. or something. That's what we have to wrap our heads around is that there were literally some land masses in some places in the world that are not there anymore, only from 12,000 years ago. Right. But they probably, it was probably engulfed and drowned, like you know submerged and that's why plates plates abduction imagine a plate diving under another one and then taking whatever's on the surface and sending it down underneath it it's yeah i'm telling you you would not wow. if, if people want to look into that's what i'm intense. talking about look into the sunken city that was found accidentally in the early 2000s off of western tip of cuba that's totally bizarre the structures down there that have been identified by sonar are impossible to be natural and yet they're two thousand feet underwater wow we have to like scratch your heads about is this direct evidence of subduction of something that survived being subducted that's crazy wow matt you have given Man, so much to info to this and take notes <laughs> yeah so much info and so much perspective and, and you've also given us your time yeah, and we, we cannot it, thank you enough for that i could see us definitely wanting to speak with you again in the future if we need a part two. sure that'd be great yeah. i enjoyed talking to you guys a lot Man, same well, and i good. feel like we're only able to scratch the surface on a lot of this stuff and and we all have, you know, limited time, but I'd love to continue the conversation, man. You've got a really fascinating perspective and, and tons and, of uh, information, and tons of information. We appreciate yeah, it. absolutely, guys. I'd love to do it again. Well, good. We will be in touch. And like I said, Matt, Matt LaCroix, we will post all of your info to where people can find you. People can find your website. People can find your books. Keep an open mind. Enlighten your mind right. and your perspective. You know, it just makes you a, a better person <laughs> and not follow of the narrative right. right yeah thank you again man have a great rest of your day and we'll talk to you soon thanks guys see you later appreciate it I'll talk to you soon All right, later. Bye. how the Dang. fuck was that Dang. that was serious that was uh next level man I he's mean, like a wise buddha he he took it to the next level on many things that was amazing so yes um thank you for listening again to the man fuse podcast you know we're just trying to bring in sources of information that help us try to understand well, dude, and I make sense of the shit that yeah. ben and i see at least the narrative and why we're here yeah i feel what like the we fuck need are to, we doing i feel like we got to unpack a little bit after that conversation we can't just let it end here okay i mean there was just too many things that were brought up that are just so deep and so vast in those conversations. And I, I appreciated what he was saying about the cathedrals and the churches and the sacred geometry, because I see it and I see these things and I'm like, oh, my God. I mean, look at these things, and, you know, and the tuning the tuning of the, the sound frequency. and the frequency. See, that's what I'm interested in. I, I, lo I love all that kind of stuff, man. You know, the dark star is a whole nother level of depth. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's threading a needle. But hey, you know, I love it. I love that he's doing the research. He's, he's putting the information out there. He's writing books. I mean, that takes some serious... Dark star, no dark star... I do believe and agree with these civilizations that have been wiped out, right. come back again and, and wiped out again. Right. I believe it's not happening on a gradual level. No. It's happening like... All of a sudden. All of a sudden, out of the fucking nowhere. Maybe maybe the ancient people had a better understanding right. than we do, and I believe that because of how in tune they were to right. the... 
to what do you call it space you want to call it the gods you want to call it the forces above us whatever it is how they were building these these structures to mimic and align with the the poles and the i mean crazy that's right and i do believe that they were more in tune with these cycles than we are for sure and you know a lot of the things that he was talking about that occurred in rome like the the calendar for example <laughs> like the, the <laughs> calendar like how we have 12 months instead of 13 like how it begins in january instead of april the natural order of things you know the year really begins the new it's the new blooming of everything you right know, everything blooms it's spring april we've talked about it but there's a lot of things like that that have shaped our lives and our culture and our beliefs beliefs and just everything around that it's important i think to reflect on that i mean because before that time before the roman empire there were civilizations that did understand these things and they created beautiful things yeah and and they knew a lot a lot more than we know but then again we have technology that we've built Mm. That, uh, even as Matt was saying, that they yeah. don't have. Right, absolutely. But I feel like the fundamental things, yeah. their ability to erect structures that we couldn't erect today is insane. Yeah. Tuned, you know, fine-tuned with frequency, yeah. with... M- Such with, a beautiful with thing. Earth, with space, with stars, and aligning it all. Can you imagine trying to align a structure to a fucking star? I yeah. mean, what kind of math skills do you need to be able to fucking compute that? It depends on a lot of things. And I mean, there, listen, th- there are a lot of different theories out there. Of course. I mean, we were talking about this earlier that all of these things, even all the things that Matt was just talking about, theories, I mean, these are theories. Based on slivers of evidence that has been found that's right you know in caves or in from these ancient civilizations but but what is your curiosity do you have curiosity toward these types of things i do i do to me it's the most interesting curiosities and now we have the technology to share this kind of information on a scale that is is unlike any other time in history. So we're seeing a lot of the behind the veil stuff. Did you see where um, Elon Musk just sent the book of the world up in space? It's like some millions of pages. Nah, that's cool. So, and anything happens to Earth, yeah. this thing can be found. Somewhere out there. Yeah, and I forget, I don't have the info of where it went, but I remember them including this text yeah a thumb drive or something whatever right that has all this stuff to where it can be downloaded see we have that ability where the ancients did not well to to matt's point you know would something like that survive if it was in space if it was we already right. sent it up right it's floating but somewhere or it's, but would it be meant to be read by you know someone else on earth with future generations i mean or is it something that is just going to go out into never endingness maybe into you where know? another species or life picks it up yeah and, what the hell was this shit pile right here yeah yeah and i thought it was interesting what he was saying i, I didn't even get into the the crystal skulls i mean i go 12 hours with that guy you yeah. know what i mean because there's so many things that again you know, we have now the technology to share this information. I mean, the guy who he works with, Billy Carson. I mean, check out Billy Carson. This is a guy who has decoded all the ancient tablets. And it's very interesting information, these historic accounts. And they all involve some type of cataclysm of some sort. Solar, the floods, and many that we don't even know about. Right. One of the things, though, that is interesting to me, there are instances where, you know, structures that are unexplainable, and we'll post some, they they still have no explanation, you know, for a lot of the ruins and the things. So, yeah. anyway. Hey, if you want to weigh in on this compelling and rich episode with Matt LaCroix, Ben H., and myself. You can hit us up, of course, at manfuse.com or 770-744-5227. If you would, honor us by sharing the show. If you think somebody would be fascinated by this conversation, you know, leave us a review. Subscribe for free on all the major podcast platforms. We love you. Thank you for listening. And uh, 
We'll talk to you soon. Peace out. Ben says bye. Ciao for now. Goodbye. Hey, thanks for listening to the Man Fuse podcast. To get more information on Matt, just check out our episode description and hit us up at manfuse.com to join the conversation or by hitting us up at 770-744-5227. Once again, pay it forward, if you will, by sharing the show. We'll talk to you soon.